I'll trust it. Well, I don't know where everyone else is. They promised they were going to be here, and I told you all I would. If we start at seven, I'll try my best to get us done fast because we don't want to be here till late thirty-five. But they're like, yeah, let's take our sweet time. Anyway, last time we looked at population growth. I also posed a question to you all about duckweed and what's going on with the duckweed. Many of you had some interesting comments. Um, many of you said it was the wind. One person said they have a disease, <laughs> which, oh, I, I'd have no evidence of supporting that they have a disease. A few of you have said it was the sunlight, and the lack of sunlight could be causing the whitening, or in fancy speak, it would cause the bleaching. That is a thing. It actually results in something called leaf senescence, which is what my second master's degree was in. Some of you also just said, oh, the plants seem stressed and the chlorophyll are dying, or something to that effect. And chloroplasts under stress conditions actually will be killed off, selectively killed off. So, I would agree with some of that. I don't think that that's actually what's going on. It's what most people said, and that is, oh, they ran out of nutrients and they're just dying. And yeah, yeah it's probably that. They're just dying because they're getting old. Or they're stressed. So today, we're going to talk about energy and nutrients and the basic patterns of this. So we'll talk about what an ecosystem is, an energy budget, how energy flows through ecosystems, and then how nutrients cycle. And, the, of course, we already know what this is going to be. Climate change is just screwing it all up. So, yay. We have objectives. We have more objectives. We have a third page of objectives. That's fun. So, ecosystems, I kind of drew or gave you a written definition in the middle of the boards last time. An ecosystem turns out to be when we have a bunch of different populations together, we call that a community, and you throw in the environment. That seems easy enough. The nice thing about ecosystems is how you wish to define it is as big or as small as you wish to look at it. We can talk about the ecosystem of your eyebrows and the things that are living on your eyebrows. We can talk about the ecosystem in this classroom. We can talk about the ecosystem that is Cypress College. We can talk about an ecosystem just in the greenhouse or in your little pots. How are your plants looking? They were stressed from the wind, so just us giving them water probably saved them. If we probably let them go for a week, they probably would have been dead. So if we didn't look on Tuesday and we checked on them today, they'd probably be dead on us. Every ecosystem, because we're looking at different clusters of organisms and different environments, all trying to have unique dynamics, so it's hard just to generalize. When you study ecosystems, each one is going to be unique. And no one can tell you that's not how that ecosystem works. No, it is, because it is the ecosystem you are observing. So again, where do we find them? Better question is, where can't you find them? They're everywhere, as long as you can find living things with non-living things. So, so far, where can't we find them? Uh, space. So far, that, that's our limit. Because as far as we've been able to tell, we can't find living things out there. It's also why NASA, whenever we send probes out or we send anything to Mars, you can't just build it and ship it. There's actually, if you were to go to JPL, have any of you ever been to JPL? Oh, nice. The drive. JPL is in the foothills near Pasadena. And if you were to go out there, it's actually not owned by NASA. It's a side contract, side hustle that NASA uses. It's actually run by Caltech, 
the university Caltech, and they build crap to go out into space. Things cost tons of money to go into space because it's expensive to shove you know, a little bit off this rock because it takes a lot of fuel to get something away from the Earth. It's also because you have to build things so they are germ-free. They have to work in pristine environments because the fear is us bringing our life to a different planet. So everything that's ever gone to Mars is pristine because we don't want to infect Mars with human life or with Earth life. So it's a weird thought of us infecting other planets, but that's potentially what would happen. Especially if we were to start to bring stuff back from another planet, our fear is what if there's something living in what we are bringing back? Because what is that living thing going to do here? And the answer is we wouldn't know. So when we look at ecosystems, we can look at it or look at three sets of dynamics for our purposes of living things. We can look at how does the energy move? Energy flows so it has a start and a stop. And the way that we describe it is it's a bottom-up cycle or a bottom-up pathway, not a cycle meaning there's going to be some type of, quote, lower organism that will be the starting point for the energy, and then it flows up a food web or a food chain. The stuff that we are consuming, the matter itself, actually cycles, so we don't actually ever get rid of it. We keep eating the same thing. You're eating the same sets of carbon that Einstein ate, that Newton ate, that the pharaohs of Egypt ate, that Jesus would have eaten if there was a Jesus, that dinosaurs ate, that the things before dinosaurs ate. It's the same set of stuff. And since it's the same set, we just have to keep recycling it over and over and over again. With this energy flow and this cycling, one of the things that we have to worry about is the tropic structure, meaning how many layers of feeding do we go through as we transfer energy from one organism to the next? How many layers of organisms do we deal with in this recycling business? And what niches do we need to have in order to make this entire thing work? So when we think of ecosystems, we have to keep all of this junk in mind, which is, of course, fun. Now let's really make sure you fall asleep. When we look at energy budgets, there's two terms that are used that sound super similar to each other, which of course is why they're not. They're related. One of them is called production. One of them is called productivity. Production is what we would say is how much stuff is made in a particular environment. Typically, when we talk production versus productivity, we're going to talk about photosynthesis. This is a photosynthesis game. The way that we measure it is how much CO2 are we sucking out of the air? How much carbon are we sucking out of the air and putting it into sugar? The production is how many kilograms of carbon you get per, squat or per square meter of land. So it's an amount. Production is an amount. If you sat there and you worked in an industry where you had to make nails, your production is... I made 15,000 nails. Good for you. You made 15,000 nails. I made 30,000 nails. Good for you. I made six. Okay. Productivity is how long did it take you to make the production? I made 15,000 nails. How long did it take you? Six months. You had... 30,000 nails. See, I did better. How long did it take you? Six years. Oh, no, you are actually worse. You made six nails. Oh, you suck. I did it in half a second. Oh, never mind. You're pretty damn fast. Production is a total amount. Productivity is telling you how quickly it was done. When we look at productivity, because it's carbon being trapped by photosynthesis, 
this bit here, which is the starting point of a sucking energy out or sucking nutrients with some energy out of the environment, is what we call primary productivity. Plants do primary productivity because they're doing photosynthesis, taking carbon out of the air, and sticking it into sugars. Secondary productivity is the moo cow coming along and chomping the grass. And the result of the moo cow eating the grass is the moo cow gets to be a bigger moo cow. And we can track how big that moo cow gets over time. So the moo cow gaining weight from eating the grass is secondary productivity. And then you say, I had to walk for this class today. That sucks. I need a hamburger. I like hamburger. Let's kill the moo cow and go nom 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 on the moo cow. So you go nom 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 on the moo cow and your belly goes big, 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 big. That would be tertiary productivity. And then you decided to go because you were inspired, as some of you were discussing on the walk. Uh, you wanted to go to Florida because you were inspired by that one guy who goes out at night to hunt you know, the reticulated pythons that they have, and he just sits there like, oh, look at this, and like picks up a python. You're like, how are you not dead yet? So you saying, I could do that. I'm in college. I can do anything. You fly yourself out to Florida, and you try and do that, and an alligator there says, you look good, rips your arm off, you bleed to death, a few other things eat you up. They are now going through... What would come after tertiary? Quaternary productivity. Primary, photosynthesis. Secondary, you ate the thing that did photosynthesis. Tertiary, you ate the thing that ate the thing that ate photosynthesis. The initial bit, primary productivity, comes from photosynthesis. Everything else, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quaternary, whatever, is a result of respiration. It's a result of us metabolizing those organic compounds. You thought you escaped cell respiration and photosynthesis when you took 174. And here at the end, I say, ha, 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 ha. They're back. Do you remember the Z scheme for photosynthesis and photosystem 1 and photosystem 2? I just spoke gibberish. You have no clue if I was telling you the truth about it or not. We can track productivity on maps. So we see pictures like this. And if we look at it, we could say, oh, I know where, they, where on Earth we have a lot of productivity. Because clearly it's these hot spots. What are these areas? The rainforests. So if we want to find high productivity, just like in your head, you would think, we want to go to the rainforests. Where's the highest production? Good job. It's the ocean. Wait, but it's like at the bottom of the colors. You're right. But notice, there's a lot of it. And a whole lot of a little bit equals a whole lot. The highest production is the ocean. It's not the highest productivity, which is in part why climate change is terrifying, because it's heating up the oceans, which could be destroying photosynthesis. We like to think that, uh-oh, if we kill off the rainforest, we're going to lose all of our oxygen. No, we'll be fine. We have to worry about taking out the oceans. Because if we take out the oceans, now we're hosed. That's inspiring. Yay. An energy budget is a way of taking all of this stuff here, so this primary, secondary, tertiary productivity, and just connecting it with a whole bunch of lines. So could we track the energy as it flows from initial source, let's assume that it's the sun, to what we would call the producers, so that they would be going through primary productivity, 
going to the first consumer, secondary productivity going to a tertiary consumer, or excuse me, a secondary consumer, that would be tertiary productivity, blah, 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 blah. All along in all of this, we have a one directional flow of energy from the sun to these organisms. The result of these organisms being alive is enzymes do their thing. When enzymes do their thing, we lose heat. So all of this energy that starts from the sun, for our practical purposes, ends up being lost as heat. The actual substances that we eat, we need to shuffle around. And obviously, if we just left these here by themselves, that wouldn't be useful. All these things shed. We call that shedding stuff detritus. And all of these organisms need to be disposed of. So we have disposers, which are, of course, decomposers. <clears throat> Name your decomposers. Fungi, very big on it. Some insects, the turkey vulture we saw. There's a group that we always ignore. We always underestimate them. And they are the ones who rule us all. Bacteria. Bacteria are the winners of this game. We are alive because bacteria let us be alive. The moment they decide they don't want us alive, we're not going to be alive. By the way. So detritus is a faint. So detritus is a variation on the word decidua. So if I said a deciduous tree, could you name for me a deciduous tree? We have a whole bunch of them right outside. I'm not staring at one right now because I'm looking at a palm, but deciduous trees are the ones that have the leaves that fall off. Decidua means to let go or to fall off. Your baby teeth in medical speak are called deciduous teeth because they fall out of your mouth. So detritus is anything that comes out of you. It's the waste that falls off from the outside or the inside. Oh, you lost a hand. Oh, that sucks. What a tragic bandsaw accident. That's detritus. Yep, feces counts. Because that's you shedding your, you shed the inside of your intestines when you do that. We can measure energy budgets. You're going to be asked actually to measure energy budgets as a lab. It's going to take us several weeks. Um, we're going to do the easy version. We're only going to look at primary productivity. We're going to ignore secondary productivity because it gets tricky and we have to trap things and whatever. So what we can do is we can track how energy manifests as mass so what we do is we assume if you eat, I don't know, 100 calories, those 100 calories are going to be turned into mass on you. So what we can do is we can just track how your weight changes over time. That seems easy. We do this with little kids all the time. They go in for their annual checkup and it's like stand on the scale. and They write down how much they weigh. And we want to see that number increase over time because it means they're getting bigger. They're gaining mass. There's a catch with this. There are two different versions of masses, a wet mass and a dry mass. A wet mass is exactly what it sounds like. It has water. You can gain weight, and it's only water. You can lose weight, but you're not losing any weight. You're just losing water. So if we want to know if you're really gaining mass, we need not a wet mass, we need the dry mass. Well, how do we do that? We shove you into an oven. And we need to suck all the water out of you. So obviously, for little kids, this would not be a really good way to figure out if they're gaining mass because you want to get one shot at it. 
But what we can do is we can estimate this mass change if we were to have a whole bunch of, I don't know, we had a whole bunch of roly polies. We're going to a whole bunch of baby roly polies, and we're going to find baby roly polies. So we're going to get their eggs, and we're going to hatch the little roly polies. A whole bunch of little baby roly polies all over the place. Everyone's going to be like, yay, it's a roly poly. You want to push them and have whoop and roll into a ball. And it'll be fun. Like, whoop, and you start rolling them around. So what we could do is we'll start with a couple hundred of them. And what I'm going to do is take one of them from each of your groups. We're going to figure out how much it weighs. Wet. And we're going to go next door where there's a drying oven. We're going to wheel it over into here, and we're going to put it right there. And we're going to say, thank you very much, probably she roly-poly, for teaching us science. Then we're going to bake it. But we're good and proper. We're going to bake it low and slow because you don't want to charcoal it. We just want to drive the water out. So we're going to bake it for about two hours at about 150. And at the end, it will just be a dehydrated roly-poly. You then get that mass. I now have my starting point. We wait a week. We get another roly-poly. We say, thank you very much for teaching us science. We get its, dry, its wet mass. You repeat the massacre. And if you do this over and over and over again, you can find out if they're gaining weight. Is it because they're just gaining water? Or are they actually getting bigger? This is how we figure out these energy budgets. We typically go after insects or some type of crustacean. We don't go after vertebrates, typically. Um, there are laws against it. But when we, take, when we do this, we usually go after dry mass. So are there, are there any other ways we could do this that don't involve, like, murders? The answer is yes, we will do this. Some of you have already told me that you will not partake in it. It's going to be an experiment that we're going to do with the mice. What you could do is stick them into a chamber and we can measure gas exchange. There's lots of assumptions and it's all math. But we can do it that way. We could do, we could do this one where we just track dry mass or we have to do a bunch of chemistry. Those are our options. We're going to do both in here. We're going to do the wet and dry mass of radish seedlings. And then we're going to do these other measurements, the math version using mice. The goal is not to let the mice like run around or anything like that. The mice are going to be used for tertiary productivity of a snake that we have in one of the back rooms. You do not get to partake in the feeding of the snake. So how do we limit this stuff? It's all abiotic factors that limit productivity. Namely because that's going to help control whether or not we're going to be having the nutrients necessary for production and productivity. This tends to be a bigger issue if you live in the water because nutrients are harder to come by. What we can do is we've actually been able to measure this rather easily, where if we were to take controls at different sites, and what we can see is things that are photosynthetic in the water don't really change much over time until we add nitrogen, which is really good after a storm, because all of our poo-poo water floods right into the ocean, because that's where everything ultimately goes anyway. And the burst of all that nitrogen results in a burst of growth of algae. And it becomes toxic to go into the water. They tell you every time it rains, do not go into the ocean. Because things that have been waiting to grow finally got their food. And they said, thank you. And when they grow in large numbers, they suck the water out or the oxygen out of the water. It tends to kill the fish. They also tend to release toxic chemicals into the water that are usually neurotoxins. Your response is, but I'm a big human. What are these little microscopic things going to do to me? 
swim through it and find out. Because when it shuts down your nervous system, the answer is they still win. This phenomenon is called eutrophication. Eutrophication is artificially adding nutrients to us to an aquatic environment. The biggest offender of eutrophication, farms. Because farming, we tend to over-fertilize. What do we do when we fertilize soil? We're adding phosphates and nitrogens. And we add more than you need to. You add water. The water pools up, then it runs away. Where does it ultimately run to? The ocean. If it pools into a pond, the pond gets covered in algae. And usually you smell the algae before you see it. So if you ever go to a place and there's like this weird, like, ooh, like, oh, God, something's, something's like rotting that you can smell, it's usually things growing in water. It's not something dead. You're smelling the algae. I don't care. <laughs> when we're gathering energy, the problem with it is there's two different ways that we can measure this. We have what we call the gross productivity, and then we have the net productivity. Even with plants, it's something that we have to take into consideration. Most people, and I'd be willing to wager most bio majors, if you were to ask them, what chemical process do plants do? They'll tell you, they do photosynthesis. So what do the animals do? Respiration. Do they do anything else? No. Well, half the time, we turn the light out. So what's the plant going to do when we turn the lights out? Does it say, I'll starve now, thank you. No. They switch over into respiration mode. Plants do respiration too. They still have mitochondria. So even a plant, it's going to make up a whole bunch of energy. It's going to have a gross productivity. But then it's going to spend some of its capital because it needs to live when there's no sunlight. The result is net primary productivity. Okay, this seems weird. You have a job. They tell you you're going to make $10,000 this month. You say, yes, I love this. You get your paycheck. Does it say $10,000? Never. You get your check. It says ten th You're told it's going to be a check for $10,000 for this month's work. It's not $10,000. It's going to be something a lot smaller than $10,000. And it makes you cry. Then you get angry. And you say, who robbed me? Why? And the answer is taxes. Taxes were taken out. Your gross pay was ten grand that month. Your net pay was $12.16. What do you get to do with that leftover $12.16? Spend it so someone else can make money. If it's a plant, they will make so many calories. They will burn off a portion of the calories they make. You then come along and eat the plant. Which one do you have access to? The original amount or the leftovers? You only get the leftovers. All secondary productivity is based on the leftovers. So if you have tertiary productivity, they only get our leftovers. Because we're going to eat something, we're going to get rid of chunks of it, and only a little bit of it is going to stick around with us. So tertiary productivity is based upon our net secondary productivity. Things that eat us get the leftovers. I already mentioned how you can measure respiration. We saw a few of these out there. Terrified some people. That's okay. The reason why energy flows is because physics says it has to, and thank you physics for telling us that. It follows the rules that we call thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is in a closed system, the amount of energy you get is constant. Of course, one of the problems is, is Earth a closed system? 
No. Therefore, we do not follow the first law of thermodynamics. How do we know it's not a closed system? Obviously, because I asked the question. So clearly, that means the answer has to be no. How do we know we're not a closed system? So interacting with stuff doesn't mean anything, because the stuff that you have, the, con the energy content has to be constant, but you it's allowed to interact. How do we know we're not a closed system? Because there's space. So stuff coming from space. What stuff? We have a hydrogen bomb eight light minutes from us. And the big hydrogen bomb is blasting us with all sorts of toxic radiation that some weird freaky plant things said, oh, I got this. I'm going to steal the toxic radiation and convert it into food. Automatically, we're not a closed system because we're constantly, constantly being bombarded with hydrogen bomb fart. The second law of thermodynamics, this one we do follow, and we do not get an option in this one, is math. You all remember this one from Gen Chem, and you're like, yes, I love solving these problems. And we could also throw in like the little circle above it, and we can make it a standard delta G, and then we could throw in KEQ with it, and then we could throw this in with like redox potentials and cells, and you're like, yes, I love life. This thing's rule is basically, if a process occurs, we lose energy. How do we lose it? The answer is always the same, heat. No, you can lose it as sound. And how does sound manifest? As vibrations. What do the vibrations do? Give off heat. No, you could also get friction. I took physics. OK, and what does friction do? You feel heat generate. The answer always boils down to heat. First law, if you can trap it and insulate it, energy is constant. Second law, problem is you're turning it all into heat. The universe is a closed system. So what does that mean? Within the universe, all of the energy that can let things exist is going to turn into heat. That is how the universe ends. It's a heat death. We will basically turn into frozen nothing. Awesome. Where are our energy sources on Earth? We got one. Sun. Do we got any others? I hope we do. So what, what about the water? So how are we turning water into energy? So it's because of a windmill. Well, you have that because we have tectonic differences. So we have higher water and lower water. So it's a potential energy because one part was raised up. And that's also because we have rain dropping down up here and going down. But we have rain dropping up here because we have sunlight. So is it just sun? I already dropped the answer. The answer is not yes. No, that's not. How do we get this side higher than this side? Tectonics. Well, what's tectonics? The earth, someone took a hammer, went boom, and cracked it into a bunch of pieces, and the pieces are moving. How are the pieces moving? Not solar radiation. The Earth has a liquid molten iron ball in the center of it that's moving around. And the molten iron ball in the center of the Earth is making the top shift around. What's our second energy source? The Earth itself. The inside of the Earth is hot. You've heard of things that live under the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean? 
in like those stackers, or the, it's not stackers, but the smokers, or geothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Only reason why there's life there is because the earth is spitting out stuff. And living things there take advantage of it. So if we were only stuck down there at the bottom, and there was no life up here up top, then yes, we get to claim first law of thermodynamics, because everything's trapped in the ocean. But that's not the case. The other thing that sucks is because that second law says everything goes away as heat, we get something that we call the 10% rule. The 10% rule is basically if you eat 100 calories of plants, you get to keep no more than 10 of those calories. You get to keep 10% of those calories. What happened to the other 90%? We know the answer. The Miami heat. How can we calculate this? It's easy. Thank you, roly polies. We can see it. Because we can see how much they eat. And based on how much they eat, we can figure out how many calories they consume. Based on how many calories we consumed, we can compare that with how much their mass went up. And it turns out it's about 10%. 10% actually is like a really good day. Is this super efficient? No. Your, your car engine, except for, you know, you fancy people with your Teslas. But for the rest of us, slow, our poor people who have to not have Teslas, we have to, you know, spend all our money at a gas station. But we'll have the last laugh when your batteries die. Because those are like 10 grand each. So ha, 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 suck that. For us, our car engines are like 30% efficient. Meaning every bit of gasoline that goes in, we make an explosion. Of that explosion, about 30% of it is good to make the car move forward. The other 70% is, is heat. So we're bet the car is better than us. And car engines are pretty good at their efficiency, which actually is kind of sucky. So, eh, oh well. How are we going to do this in lab? Uh, we're going to do this with plants. We're going to take them, pluck them out, we're going to track their dry mass over time. As simple as that. How do we measure their production? We can just say, here's how much their mass changed. We can just say the mass changed by this much. How do we make it productivity? We divide it by how long it is between the measurements. So divide it by 7 days, 14 days, 21 days. Only way that you make production into productivity, divide by a time unit. We can track how this looks in what we call energy pyramids, which is something that we've basically been alluded to the entire time. The sun produces a whole bunch of energy. Plants say, thank you very much, and they make some food out of it. Grasshopper comes along and says, yes, let me eat that plant. If there's 10,000 joules of energy, joules being the SI term, so if we take 10,000 joules of energy, Roughly 10% of it passes on to the grasshopper, which would be about 1,000 calories. Kangaroo rat eats the grasshopper, about 10% moves on, so 100 joules. You eat, or a hawk comes along, eats the kangaroo rat, it gets 10% of the kangaroo rat, which is about 10 joules of energy. Again, it's about 10%, it's not really, but somewhere on the order of it. So what does this tell us? If we wanted to feed the world, could we do it right now? Without any politics, could we feed the entire world? No one is starving anywhere. The answer is, of course. All we need to do is, if we make this super simple, where we go grass, and let's be honest, cows don't eat grass in America. They eat corn and they're not supposed to eat corn. So we have corn, moo cow, 
American. Well, that's a 90% times a 90% loss. That's a lot of energy immediately lost just by us eating the moo cow. If we wanted to have enough food for everyone, what do we just need to do? Cut out the moo cow. Just jump straight to the plants. We will have more than enough food for the entire Earth. And that's just probably from us. If all the food that we put into moo cows and pigs went to people, there's no starving people. We're done. And it's a simple physics problem. Are we going to do that? Of course not, because moo cows are delicious. They're cute if you look at them, so that's why you can't look at them. And you can't watch any of the videos of how they get butchered either. You can't watch any of that, because it's sad. We can also look at masses. So when we look at masses, what we can see are two different patterns where we actually have a huge mass of the producers, and as we go up, there's just not as many of them. But there are other systems, aquatic ones, where the mass actually flip-flops, where we could actually have the producers that actually there's not as much as we get of the consumers. So using mass as the way to judge how energy is transferring only works if we are talking about a terrestrial system. We go into an aquatic system, it gets harder. So for this bit here, we're going to follow the terrestrial option. The last topic. Ha! We're almost done. I know you're like, oh, I can wake back up now. So energy flows from sun out as heat. But the stuff that you're eating stayed here. And we have to shuffle that junk around. So that stuff there has to follow what we call the conservation of matter, which is you can't create matter, you can't destroy matter unless you make an atomic bomb because you watched Oppenheimer. The stuff has to stick around. So if we are in a closed system, meaning we're not ejecting stuff into space, this works. Are we humans of 2023 in a closed system? The answer is, of course, we're not. How do we know? Because we've shipped stuff into space that's never coming back. So we have made it that we're not a closed system anymore. We have made it so we have opened up. But it's not normal. With these cycles, what we're going to see is things can move back and forth between living systems and non-living systems. We'll see an oscillation between the biotic and the abiotic. The elements that turn out to be important are honk, the honk, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. Why? Because we're primarily made out of these things. We also have phosphorus and sulfur. Phosphorus because it's useful in DNA and RNA. Sulfur because it's used in protein. So if we were to look at some type of nutrient cycle, we care about the ones that make us. There are other nutrient cycles. So we have some for sodium. We have some for potassium. We have it for magnesium. We have it for iron. We have it for copper. We use molybdenum for some reason. We use iodine for like a thing in your neck. We have some weirdos out there. For the most part, we don't care. I'll let you know right now, for the test, which is actually coming up really soon, a week from today, all we're doing in class is reviewing for your first test. <clears throat> your first test is a week from Tuesday. Hi. Hope you're having a great evening. I'm going to make a list of things for you so that you have an idea as to what's going on. Those of you who get testing accommodations, we will have a chat as to how you would like that to manifest. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to give you a list of potential free response questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a hat up here. And in the hat are going to be little slips of paper that will have the free response questions. Which free response question are you going to get? You're going to reach on in and pull it out 
and that's your free response question. I'm going to tell you right now, some of them are going to be, draw me a nutrient cycle. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to have some of you draw these. Does that mean you're going to get it? I don't know. Which one? I'm not sure yet. It depends if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood when I put it together. Just being honest. Just being honest. Let's start easy. The water cycle. Okay, we know the water cycle. We all met Ricky, Ricky the Raindrop when we were in elementary school. We got the little coloring books. I like this. The water cycle. It's my friend. Except we live in California. We don't know what water is. It comes down from the sky. We all get terrified. and We can't drive on a freeway. Why can't we drive on the freeway? Because of the oils. The oils leach out of our roads. If it rained more often, it wouldn't be a problem. But because it rains so infrequently, they leach out. And it doesn't matter how good of a driver you are. You're going to spin out. Sorry. Unless you're driving five miles an hour on the freeway. In which case, everyone just hates your existence. So the water cycle. We know this. You have a whole bunch of water. It's going to evaporate. Here it's saying it's from the ocean. Does it need to be from the ocean? No, we just need to evaporate out. If we evaporate out, what we're going to get is enough of that moisture is going to be in the air. At some point, the air is going to cool down. It will cool down better if we can move it over land or near a mountain. But as this water in the air cools down, it will condense into things that we can visibly see, and we call those clouds. Clouds look light and fluffy. They weigh millions of tons. Or not millions, but they weigh several tons. They're insanely heavy. It's just they're made out of lily bitty water droplets. They're suspended. It's going to stay that way until it gets cold enough or enough dust gets inside of it that it causes those water droplets to coalesce on each other or nucleate. When that happens, we will get precipitation. Yay! If it precipitates over water, we're just dumping it right on back. Is the water that comes down out of a cloud pure? Of course not. It's running into stuff on the way down. But if you can get it inside of a space where there wasn't interacting with any type of pollution or dust particles, would it be pure water? Yes, it would. It used to be, for the longest time in California, it was illegal to collect rainwater. Because most of us would just have it in a barrel, not do anything with it, and then you'd have mosquitoes breeding in it, we'd have other insects breeding in it, we'd have rats peeing in it, and then you're like, I'm going to drink this water, except now drinking like rat pee water. And, you know, they changed it, I think, that we're now allowed to as long as it's like sealed and you're like testing it and like killing things in it. And then even then, I think you're only allowed to use it for like watering your lawns and stuff like that. You're not allowed to use it as potable water. Anyway, dump the water on back. If it dumps over land, what it's going to do is a few options. Option number one, it can collect. Option number two, it can run off into a larger body of water. Option number three is it can percolate into the ground and become what we call groundwater. If it's groundwater, it can either stay there or it could eventually move up to the surface or it could run to a larger body of water. We've heard this cycle before. There's one piece that's missing, unfortunately. That's that word right there. Transpiration. Transpiration is why your plants were wilted. Plants, the way that they move water from their roots up on out, is they have little itty bitty holes underneath them. They're called stomata. The water dumps out, and if it's windy, the water dumps out faster, and it causes the plant to dehydrate, and it wilts. That loss of water from the roots up through the leaves is called transpiration. We get water in the air because of plants. Because the plants are losing the water. Who's calling me? Potential spam. 
my daughter were here, it'd be Grace. Answer it. She loves to answer spam phone calls. Because, who are you? Why are you calling my daddy? I don't like you. You need to stop. And usually if there's someone on the other side, I don't like they hang up. It's very amusing. Unless the person actually speaks back, then she freaks out and she hangs up. <laughs> Never happened with me, but it happened. I've seen it happen once. And she's <laughs> There's actually another bit here that's not shown in this picture, and that is living things respire. And one of the things that we breathe out is water. Glasses fogging up. Carbon and oxygen combine into a cycle. So this one here, it's primarily a playoff of photosynthesis and cell respiration. So everything is going through cell respiration. It's going to dump CO2 into the air. We're going to recapture it through photosynthesis. If it's on land, then things on land are going to eat it. If it's in the water, then things in the water are going to consume it. Under a few weirdo conditions that are not shown here, that CO2 can get stuck in the water itself. And we can precipitate it out of the water as a carbonate. Some of this stuff that's in the water can actually end up solidifying and being just found on the bottom of an ocean. And it can stay there. So we can trap CO2 as just sea sludge at the bottom of the ocean. The problem then becomes if we start kicking it up, kicking it up runs the risk of it falling apart and it leaving the ocean. And if that happens, then we're having the ocean release more CO2 out. We also have to worry about burning of fossil fuels because that's obviously going to dump CO2 into the air. We could do the exact opposite processes to explain what's going on with oxygen. So it's not too bad. This one's pretty simple. If I had to wager on which one I would want to get, I'd want this one. This is the one where I hate you. The nitrogen cycle is complicated. Nitrogen is most of our atmosphere. We can take this nitrogen, which is basically useless, and we can fix it, meaning I can turn it into a useful form. One of those ways is a lightning bolt. Lightning can take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into nitrates. Those nitrates are, or are potentially useful to organisms. We can, the organisms can take in the nitrates, convert them into different products, and then stick them around in their cells and use them as proteins and what have you. Eventually, those things will die. They can either build up as sediment. They can decompose, but it kind of stays there. So we can get this huge buildup of nitrogen just at the bottom of aquatic bodies which is why most water is devoid of nitrogen. It builds up at the bottom. Okay, so then how do you bring it back? We need to bring that sludge out or have it be brought back up due to dehyd you know, the water level drops. We have uplift and this part becomes exposed to the surface. We have bacteria that live in the soil that are called denitrifying bacteria. And they will take this sludge here and turn it back into atmospheric nitrogen. So this part here that just naturally shows up because of a lightning bolt can be put back into the air by nitrogen, or by bacteria. Other bacteria can take the nitrogen from the air and fix it in things that we call root nodules. The most famous of these turn out to be legumes. So legume plants have these little bulbs on their roots. We'll talk about how the root nodules form later on. But inside of them, they will have nitrogen fixating bacteria. And what they will do is convert that nitrogen from the air into ammonia. And then that ammonia gets used for plants for whatever they're going to do. We eat the plants. We poop it out. Plants use it again. This cycle keeps going until eventually they come across these denitrifying bacteria. And then it goes back into the atmosphere. We have gotten smart, and we've actually figured out ways to suck nit or nitrogen out of the air and turn it into fertilizers, but those fertilizers then find their way back because the bacteria are still there.
The phosphorus cycle, what? There's a phosphorus cycle? Of course there is. There's a cycle for everything. Then the phosphorus cycle is pretty boring. Most phosphorus is trapped in rocks. So then we have wind, we have rain, we have flowing rivers. They break apart the rocks. We call that weathering. Eventually, we'll get small pieces that go into runoff. Runoff is going to make it into, an, into a body of water where it's going to be picked up by either plankton or it can be picked up by a plant. Once a living thing picks up the phosphorus in the form of phosphate, we're now good to go. Because once we have, it, have that phosphate inside of a living thing, we can either have it moving between fungi, plants, and animals, shuffling back and forth within aquatic systems. We can keep doing this over and over and over again until eventually it lands itself in the ocean or a large body of water that's not going away anytime soon, and it drops out in the bottom because phosphates do not dissolve. And we wait until it's brought up to the surface again, and then we repeat. This cycle takes millions of years. This cycle, it depends on which path you take. It can be fast, it can be short. This one's happening all the time. It's pretty short. Depends on where you live. So, can be fast, pretty fast. Eh, depends. This takes a long time. So what are we doing with climate change? We're altering the distribution of energy, which means we're changing the abiotic factors, which means we're starting to mess with primary productivity. And if we mess with primary productivity, we mess with those cycles. Because let's see. Yep, plants. Um, yep, plants. Um, yep, plants. Um, yep, plants. They're all involved. We mess with the plants. We mess with everything downwind of it. So that sucks. So what is this going to do to food pyramids? I don't know. What is it going to do to food webs? I don't know. What is it going to do to diversity? I don't know. I'll be dead. You'll be alive. Good luck. On your way out, on the pink card. No, not the pink one. Sorry. Pink one is what you used two times ago. The green one. This one's just a stupid question. You want to study biogeochemical cycles. Why? I don't know. You can make a lot of money if you do this. You could make tons of money. But this is what you want to study. I have an unlimited budget for you to study it. Where are you going to study these cycles? And why are you going to that place to study the cycles? Everything is paid for. You get first class accommodations. You're taking first class all the way out. If you're 21, you're going to have all the alcohol you want there, all the alcohol you want back. You get room service. You can even have like all your Ubers are paid for. And you can be like, yes, take me there. And yes, we'll even give you a shopping spree if you need to have a shopping spree. But you want to get one day because you're there for science. Where would you go to study this stuff and why? If on your way out, you can leave me the pink and you can leave me your permission slip for today. Because I have to turn those in. Whichever one it is, the green or the pink or whatever. Whatever one only is used on one side, that's the one I mean. Hold on to James Dealey until after that field trip. Yeah, so there should be two for today. But I only want the... Yeah, because you got four pieces of paper. So the two that dealt with today are the ones I want. 